may be seated. As you're being seated, either open your Bible or open your Bible app, either Open it or turn it on, whatever your preference may be. Uh, we do this crazy thing around here at Gospel City Church. We open the Bible and we march verse by verse through books of the Bible. It was December the 5th, 2018, the first time that I told you, open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke. And we started in chapter 1. And now here we are almost a year and a half later and we are in chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 is where you're turning in your Bible. And we've... Uh, started this series called Lead Me to the Cross. Today, we are going to learn about a disciple who did not make it all the way to the cross. Now, please understand, any disciple that is unwilling to be led to the cross is not a true disciple. Today, we're going to learn the difference between genuine Christians and nominal Christians. Now, when I say nominal, we need to understand what we're talking about here. And when we say Christians, we need to certainly understand what we're talking about. When we talk about nominal Christians, we are not talking about average, ordinary, subpar, remedial, backslidden Christians. That's not what the word nominal means. The word nominal means in name only. You see, there is a whole host of Christians, quote unquote. Does everybody know what air quotes do? Everybody do this back at me. Does everybody, do, do you know what air quotes do? It's like what you're talking about is not the real thing. So when we talk about nominal Christians, we are not talking about genuine Christians. Nominal Christians are not Christians at all. And yet, I believe there are millions of nominal Christians who will be seated in churches and watching online church services all across America today. Do you know that such a thing exists? As a matter of fact, we're about to be introduced to one. Every story needs a good villain. And throughout the Bible, we're introduced to some villains. The one that we're about to be introduced to today is named Judas. Do you know about Judas? Judas, obviously, if you know the story, was the one who betrayed Christ. And right before Jesus went all the way to the cross, Judas stopped in his tracks and he said, I'm not going there. And in a reversal of what his life had been like for three years, he betrayed Jesus. And there are a lot of people like Judas sitting in our churches today. So we need to look at what the Bible has to say about Judas. Let's pick up the story in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 3. Are you with me? If you're with me, say go. go. Luke 22 verse 3 says, Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot. By the way, there were several different men listed in the Bible with the name Judas. It was a popular name, kind of like John is today. And so he distinguishes which Judas we're talking about by the name Iscariot, which was kind of a family name. Uh, maybe that was the name of his dad. Maybe it was the region he was from. But it, Judas, who is called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. Twelve disciples. Judas was always listed in the Bible as one of the twelve. Interestingly, he's always listed last. We're going to find out why here in a minute. Verse 4 says, he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Now, the Bible picks up the story of a man named Peter. If you were watching online a couple of weeks ago, uh, we studied and examined how the apostle Peter actually betrayed and denied Jesus. And that's where the story picks up in the rest of, of Luke chapter 22. But you have to go to the end of 22 in order to see the rest of the story with Judas. So let your eyes go down on the page to verse 47. Story of Judas picks back up. It says, while he was speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. And he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray me 
Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Not every person who identifies as a Christian is actually a genuine Christian. And the statistics prove it out. Now, recent surveys are done and they ask, how do you identify yourself religiously? Did you know that over 80% of people in America identify themselves as Christians? You would think it's an overwhelming majority. But when you begin to examine what those quote-unquote nominal Christians believe about the Bible, whether or not they believe it's the self-disclosure of God, what they believe about Jesus, whether or not they believe he was just a good man or whether he was the God man, whether or not they believe that he actually rose from the dead and died on the cross in the place of sinners like you and me, what you find out is those nominal Christians are not Christians at all according to the biblical definition of Christians. That 80% is more like 8% of those who actually show credible evidence of being genuine followers of Jesus Christ. If you are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, you are a minority in this country. Uh, Micah and Pastor Stephen and I are uh, spending some time on Friday mornings in a group in downtown South Bend where we're learning from one another about issues of diversity and race and justice. And so uh, really grateful for Corey Lance, who's put together this group and invited very different people. There's black and white, there's men and women, there's married grandmothers, there's single moms and single, never been married. And we're just listening to one another. And the way that uh, we're talking to one another is some, somebody throws a question in the circle and then we all go around and just answer the question. And uh, this past Friday, the question that was asked was this, has there been a time when you were in a group when you felt like a minority? And what did that feel like? Now, for those of us in the group that are white, we're part of the majority culture in America. And so obviously this is to help us understand what it's like to be in the minority. So when the circle got around to me and I responded to that, I just simply said, I have felt like I was a minority since I was 15 years old. Because when I was 15 years old, that's the point at which I surrendered my life fully and completely to Jesus Christ. And as soon as I did, I lost all my friends. I stopped getting invited to the popular parties. I was marginalized. I was ridiculed by teachers who made fun of me and wouldn't let me write on the assignments that I wanted to write on. And if I did, then they let me know about it. And, and if you are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ... You are in the minority. Now, you may think, really? Because, I mean, I thought this was a Christian country. There may be some vestiges of a Christian country left in our country. But if you look in our country, you see all types of Christian culture that has saturated our, our country. There's Christian holidays on our calendar. There's Christian books and Christian television and Christian radio and Christian podcasts. There's Christian t-shirts. There's Christian language. There's Christian churches. And if somehow you've gotten caught up or saturated with Christian culture without actually repenting of sin, placing faith in Jesus Christ, it is very possible that you are nothing more than a nominal Christian. Like Judas, you were in the Christian culture, but you've never genuinely become a Christian. The larger and the more prominent that Gospel City Church becomes, it is prone to attract nominal Christians. You know why? Because we now have amenities. I mean, look at this beautiful room and this comfortable setting. and Look how wonderful the music is and the lights and, and the sound is so nice. And um, maybe one day they'll actually grow to the point where they serve coffee in the foyer. And some of you are like, yeah, when's that going to happen? It's like, well, listen, it's not going to happen if it's going to attract nominal Christians. Now, you can drink coffee and be a genuine Christian, I think 
because I've done that. But uh, if the only reason you're showing up at church is to get some Christian coffee and be around Christian culture, you have missed the whole point. And so we're going to study this from the life of Judas. You do not want to be a Judas. So who was this guy? Let's give him some evaluation here. First of all, Judas was one of the guys. Judas was called, like every other disciple, by Jesus to follow him. And there was a point at which Judas left everything, like every other disciple, and he began to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. He was listed always among the twelve, and he was accepted. Do you know why? Because he was well-behaved. It's quite possible that he was more well-behaved than Peter or John, who were called the sons of thunder. Nobody called Judas the son of thunder. He was just probably very nice to be around, very pleasant. And they trusted him. The other 11 disciples trusted him so much that they made him their treasurer. They gave him their money. You don't give your money to somebody you don't believe is authentic. So externally, he was well behaved, had great external performance. And as a matter of fact, when Jesus brought the 12 disciples together for the Last Supper, and Jesus looked at those 12 guys and said, one of you will betray me. Do you know what the other 12 disciples said to Jesus? Is it me? Notice they didn't say, is it Judas? Why? Because his performance up until that point was so acceptable. He had adopted a Christian culture. He was certainly among the 12. He was one of the guys. Secondly, Judas had unlimited access to the gospel. I mean, think about it. No one was more familiar with Jesus than Judas. No one ever heard better sermons than Judas. No one was ever exposed to more evidence than Judas. No one was ever in a better small group or had a better small group leader than Judas. Judas had the clearest discipleship pathway than anyone. And so we need to understand you can have all of that and still not be a genuine Christian. Uh, some of you may say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic. And if I was intellectually honest, I would have to tell you, I have trouble believing in the miracles that I read about in the Bible. I have trouble believing that Jesus raised the dead. You know, if I could have walked and talked and seen what Jesus did and heard what Jesus actually said, I think I could overcome some of my doubts and become a Christian. That's no guarantee. Judas had all of that, and yet he still didn't believe. He betrayed Jesus. The word betrayed there is an interesting word. And for those of us that are genuine Christians, we understand that we still have a capacity to betray Jesus. Not fully and finally, but in reality, every act of sin is a betrayal of the one whom we have said we believe. There is a little Judas that still lives on the inside of me. Every time I choose to do something that violates what I actually say I believe, that is sin. And it's, it's still the residual part of me that's yet to be fixed, yet to be redeemed. And we look forward to the day that one day we're going to get all of that fixed in heaven, unhindered to live as God intended me to live. Judas had unlimited access to the gospel. And yet, despite what he saw, despite what he heard, despite what he experienced, he betrayed Jesus. Judas was really uncomfortable about, around extravagant worshipers. There's a story in the Bible about a sinful woman who came and she loved Jesus so much. She'd been forgiven of so much that she, she brought her most costly possession. It was her perfume. And she poured that on Jesus as an act of extravagant worship. And that was really confusing to Judas. He stepped back and he's like, why in the world would she do that? when she could have used that money to help the poor. 
he was really uncomfortable and really confused about people that would give all they had as an act of worship. Judas pretended to love Jesus. The story here that we just read is the point at which Jesus was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Judas had arranged with the religious authorities to identify Jesus by giving him a kiss on the, she- on the cheek. It would have been the equivalent in our culture of shaking hands. Do you remember that? Do you remember years ago when we used to be able to shake hands? Remember that? And so instead of shaking hands, he went up and gave him a little peck on the cheek there. Have you ever wondered why he chose to identify Jesus with a kiss? Why wouldn't he just point to him like that guy? Why not just, you know, give him a pat on the back? If he was so angry at him, why didn't he just slug him in the nose? Instead, he uses an intimate sign of affection. When I was a kid, we used to go off to church camp, and there was a rule at church camp. No PDA allowed. Do you know what PDA is? Public displays of affection. Nobody wants to see you holding hands with your girlfriend. Nobody wants to see you kissing each other. Don't be doing that. I wish I could make a rule in church. No PDA on Jesus. No public displays of affection unless there is an actual internal relationship, a love relationship with him. Judas had no love for Jesus and yet he had external signs to try to mask his lack of love for Jesus. Now, so often I think we do the same thing. I think that that happens in this room. We sing our songs, we raise our hands, we give our money, we pray our prayers. How much of it is actually just an external public display of affection that lacks no depth of worship in our hearts? And if that is all you've ever given, is external kisses to Jesus, you are a nominal Christian like Judas. Judas was motivated by self-interest. Now, why would Judas follow Christ for three years, hear all of the sermons, see all of the miracles, even preach the gospel himself, and yet at the end sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. What motivated him? Well, Judas at the beginning must have thought that Jesus Jesus was going to be an earthly king. He talked about a kingdom. He must have missed the parts where Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, but maybe in hopes of overthrowing the Roman government and maybe Judas had aspirations of being like vice president or part of the cabinet. He continued to put up with the inconvenience of following Jesus around. But here in the last week of Jesus' life, Jesus is talking about death. He's talking about going to a cross. He's talking about shedding his blood. And for the first time, maybe Judas realized this is not going to have any benefit for me. My life's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. And at that point, he chose to sell Jesus out and liquidate as much of his investment as he can. Judas did not follow Jesus because he wanted to serve Jesus. Judas followed Jesus because he wanted Jesus to serve him. Why do you follow Jesus? I mean, honestly, do you follow Jesus because of what Jesus can do for you? Or is there a genuine love because of what Jesus has done for you that you want to serve him? You see, there is a kind of disciple, quote unquote, air quote disciple. There is a kind of disciple who follows Jesus because he thinks Jesus will give him wealth, health, and prosperity. He has a Ben Franklin theology. Jesus made me healthy, wealthy, and wise. And as long as you're making me healthy, wealthy, and wise, I will love you, I will serve you. And yet... There is a false gospel that promises those things 
without cost, and it is creating millions of nominal Christians. It is the kind of gospel that will not save you. Any gospel that minimizes the cost of following Jesus will only make you a nominal disciple in name only at best. Judas was a portrait of a nominal disciple. Now, some of you may be even questioning my judgment here. Like, Trent, you keep saying he wasn't a genuine Christian. How do we know that? I mean, do we know his heart? I mean, maybe he was a genuine Christian and maybe he lost his salvation. That question's always on the table when you start talking about Judas. And listen around here, if you've attended long enough, we know uh, the, the way that we've taught you is that a, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ cannot fully and finally fall away from Christ. Someone who falls away from Christ, like Judas, and many other people that are identified in Scripture, we would have to understand they weren't genuine believers to begin with because salvation is not a work of man. Salvation is the result of God's decree declaring the guilty innocent. What God does in salvation is that he changes the legal status of a sinner to innocent. It would take God reversing that in order for him to lose what God had already given him. So salvation is an irreversible, irrevocable decree by God that gives me eternal life with him, not only in heaven, but on earth. Had that happened for Judas? Absolutely not. And here's why we can say that with such confidence. Because that's what Jesus said. Jesus one day was talking about being betrayed. And he was talking about his disciples. And he said, not one of them, not one of the twelve has been lost except for the son of destruction. Another translation says the son of perdition, which means damnation. It means absolute eternal ruin. That was his description of Judas. In another place, he's talking about being betrayed in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, and he says, woe to the man whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not yet been born. You don't say that about somebody who's going to spend an eternity in heaven. And so Jesus' verdict on Judas is that even though he was caught up in a Christian culture, he was only a nominal Christian in name only. We know that also when we contrast his life with Peter again in Luke chapter 22. It's a parallel story of what happened to Peter and what happened to Judas. Peter sinned. Peter denied Jesus three times. We learned a couple of weeks ago, if you were watching online, about how Peter, his, his faith faltered, and yet Jesus was faithful to him. Peter looked at Jesus. Jesus looked back at him, and there was a moment of conviction that brought tears to Peter's eyes, and not just external public display of repentance, but it so fundamentally changed him that he became the leader of the early church preaching a bold gospel salvation. And that became the foundation for what we have in the church. Now, when Judas sinned, he also felt remorse. As a matter of fact, he took those 30 pieces of silver and he threw them back at the guys that gave them. Was that repentance or was that remorse? Well, we know because of what happened next. The Bible says that Peter went out and hung himself. He committed suicide. Now, not every person that commits suicide is a nominal Christian. Not every person that commits suicide is a non-Christian. If you've been raised in the Catholic Church, that's what you've been taught because they consider suicide a mortal sin. But we know that all kinds of depression and mental illness and, and sinful thoughts that can bring shame and guilt can produce all kinds of, of agony of the soul. We, we know that that's true. If you are in that situation and you are thinking of self-harm and you are ashamed, please reach out to one of our pastors. We would love to help you through that. Your life doesn't have to end like Judas. But we understand that Judas... 
Judas was not lost because he committed suicide. Jesus, Judas committed suicide because he was lost. But we understand the parallel stories between Peter who repented and Judas who did not distinguished between a nominal Christian Judas and a genuine Christian Peter. So let me ask you this. What kind of Christian are you? I've got three chairs over here, and I want to call your attention to them here, okay? Now, first chair over here, we're going to label this chair the non-Christian, all right? I don't know everybody in the room, but I do know this about everybody in this room and everybody watching online. Every one of us was born in this chair, okay? I've asked people, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. When did you become a Christian? And I have had people look me in the eye and say, oh, I've always been a Christian. No, 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 no. No, no one is always a Christian. We are born into sin. The original sin of our great, 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 great granddaddy, Adam, has been imputed to us because we are human we are born with a bent and orientation away from God. We're born allergic to God with this magnetic attraction to selfish sin. How many of your parents? How many of your parents? You, you, have, you have children? Are your children cute? Raise your hand if you have a cute child. At least one cute child, okay? You got one cute and then there's the others, right? But every one of those cute children, you do not have to convince a parent of a small child that their children were born in this seat. They're born dirty, rotten, cute, but bad with a bent to take you on and to control your life. And even though they have no ability to take care of themselves, they think that they do. And we're describing every human being that's born in this seat. The problem is, is they grow up and they turn into teenagers. And does that do anything to help that situation? No, it just starts bubbling out, right? Now listen, I, I was born in this seat, okay? And, and you may still be in this seat. And, and you may be intellectually honest enough to say, I, I took a risk coming to church today because I'm going to be around a bunch of these crazy Christians. Somebody's going to open the Bible. There's going to be praying and singing. And I don't know if I really feel comfortable in all that, but I'll give it a try. Thank you for coming here and taking that risk. You probably feel like you're in the minority. I hope you feel welcome here. I hope you feel welcome to bring your doubts here. As long as you're willing to have the conversation or let me scream at you and tell you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Thank you for coming. I hope you'll come back. But here's the thing. You have to get to the place where you admit this is a reality for you. That my sin has separated me from God. That I have been born under the judgment of God. Until or unless something or someone delivers me from this seat, my eternal destiny is, separated, is separation from God in a place that's described in the Bible as a lake of fire. So I hope you're interested in getting out of this seat. You may say, well, I, I, I'm curious, but to be honest, you know, some of the stories in the Bible are really weird, and I don't know if I can believe a book that's a, that old, and really, Jesus, I know he's a good man, but he was a God man. I just got questions. Listen, those are great things to ask. We all have to ask those questions. I, I applaud you for being intellectually honest enough to admit those things. But for those of us who are genuine Christians, here's what's happened. The Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to the fact that we really are that bad. There's nothing we could ever do good enough to get out of this seat. And we've come to the place where we can humbly admit, yes, at my very core, I am not God. I have actually become an enemy of God. My sin, even though compared to others, it might look really marginal, Compared to Jesus, it looks really, really offensive and unholy. And we have acknowledged that and cried out to God for mercy and grace. And at that point, when there is that kind of humility and that kind of desperation, what God does is he pulls us out of the seat and he delivers us 
from that into this seat. We'll call this a genuine Christian. What do you have to do to get in this seat? You have to do two things. You have to repent of sin and you have to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Even the act of what I'm doing right now is an act of faith. Did you watch me express my faith? Notice my feet are not on the floor anymore. Notice my seat is not in that seat anymore. When it was over there, I was trusting that chair. Now I'm trusting all of my weight to this chair. I'm just trusting. It's, 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 the chair is doing what it's supposed to do. It's keeping me off the floor. And that's what we do when we put our faith in Jesus. You have to stop trusting whatever else it was trust, you were trusting, your religion, your heritage, your good behavior, your great family, your performance, your intellect. Stop trusting that. Start trusting this. This is Jesus. Now, even genuine Christians know that there was a, there's a bit of a paradox in what I just said. I said you had to do two things, repent and believe. But a genuine Christian knows there's really nothing you can do. In that chair, when you're trying to earn favor with God, your philosophy is, I got to do, I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. In this chair, it is done, it is done, it is done, it is done. It's not what I do, it's what Jesus did. So a genuine Christian understands the holiness of God, that I need to be delivered, that Jesus on that cross did the two things necessary for my salvation. Number one, he paid the penalty with his death and he performed my perfection with his life so that Jesus' substitutionary death and substitutionary life were done for me. All I have to do is embrace that, receive it as a gift. And when you do, it radically transforms the way you think, the way you live, the way you act, the way you talk every day. It's not that we stop sinning. It's just that every day, every time I sin, I keep trusting. I have to remind myself, I've sinned. It's an offense to God. I'm trusting what Jesus has done on that cross. Okay? Now, can I just, I just, I don't know if I can tell you this or not. I, I, this church exists to get you in this chair. And if you're not in this chair, we, we'll do anything to help you get in this chair. The problem, the reason why some of you are not in this chair is because you are in this chair. And if you are in this chair, you probably think you're in that chair. You, you will not admit you're in that chair because you know some of these people and you're better than them. You look at these people and you're like, oh, but those people don't even re vote Republican. Yeah, I wouldn't want to, you know, be in a chair like that. By the way, a lot of people in this chair are not in that chair because you're a Republican. And you, you call yourself this and yet you don't act like the way that the Bible describes, okay? And I'm teasing that you can be a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, or an Atheist and, and still not go to heaven, okay? That's not the point. The point is this. If you were raised in a Christian country, you can be a really conservative person who is pro-life and all about free speech. You can be so committed to the First and the Second Amendment. And the problem is you're more committed to the first and second amendment than you are the first and second commandment, which says, put no other God before me, including the Constitution or the president or your political position. And so the problem is, is the, this is not a voting block, okay? It, we, what happens is, 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 is what happened to me. So, so here's the deal. June 17th, 1967, I was born in this chair. On August 28th, 1982, God translated me into this chair. But let me tell you what happened along the way. I went to a seventh grade Sunday school class. For the first time, I went to church by myself. And after three or four weeks, people opening the Bible, Sunday school lesson. My Sunday school teacher came to me and he says, Hey, Trent, thanks for coming to church. I know you've been coming to church. I just wondered, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been saved? I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought he was talking about like being in a burning building and a fire team, rescue team coming in and rescuing me from, saving me from the fire. And I said, no, I've never had that happen. 
He said, well, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Well, absolutely. Doesn't everybody want to go to heaven when you die? Sure. He said, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you need to pray and ask Jesus to forgive your sin. Would you want to know more about that? I said, yes. He took me off into a room for about 20 minutes. He took me through about 10 different Bible verses. He explained what they meant. And then he asked me a question. He said, does that make sense to you? I said, mm-hmm. He said, would you like to pray and ask Jesus to forgive your sin? I said, okay. He said, okay, well, all you have to do is pray what I pray. I'll, I'll pray a sentence, you pray a sentence. And so he prayed something like this, dear Lord Jesus. I said, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross. I commit my life to you. Help me to be the kind of Christian you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. He looked at me, he said, did you mean it? I said, sure. 30 minutes later, I was in the baptistry. I was a Baptist church. What else are you going to do after that? I mean, that's what you do, right? You know, it's like, okay, and hand me a towel, hand me a, a Bible, give me a certificate that said all of that really happened. And guess what? I became a nominal Christian. I started calling myself a Christian. Other people started calling me a Christian. And I started listening to some Christian music, and I started re reading some Christian books, and going to Christian concerts and just, it, it, I had Christian t-shirts and I got caught up in the Christian culture for three years. Thinking I was this, I was this. The difference between this and this is one word, it's repentance. Do you know what happened after I prayed that prayer? Nothing. Nothing. The only thing that changed in my life was I went to church a little more often. My attitude toward authority didn't change. My hunger for God's word didn't change. My vocabulary didn't change. No change. The only thing that changed is the name. Now, there's a lot of people in this chair. You can be a God and country nominal Christian. You can be a social justice nominal Christian. You think, yeah, I know what those talking about. What happens really if you're a Christian is you feed the poor, you protest injustice. That's, what, that's the demonstration of genuine Christianity. That, that, that's great. That's not the indication that you're a Christian. Now, if you're like me and you're a teenager, not, I'm not still a teenager. I know that's a shock to you. I was a teenager when this happened. This is what happens with teenagers a lot of times. They, they, there's a lot of mobility that happens between these two chairs. I mean, if you were born in a Christian home, and some of you, 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 you went to church nine months before you were born. I mean, you, just, just, you had no choice. You had a drug problem as a kid, right? You were drugged to church, and that's, it didn't matter. But you just, somehow somebody slapped a label on your head. Somebody you, took you to vacation Bible school, and they told you to ask Jesus into your heart. Did you do that? Did you ask Jesus into your heart? No, not a prayer in the Bible, but not necessarily a bad thing, but it's like just that little simple formula. Is Parents, is that what you want your children to, to have their confidence in eternal security is somehow they've asked Jesus into their heart? It, it's, salvation is not inviting Jesus into your heart. It's responding to Jesus' invitation to his heart. And so if these types of things have happened, you come to church, you read your Bible, you got confirmed, maybe you got baptized, maybe it's the family tradition, somehow, you don't even really know how you got in this seat. The question is, has there ever been a transformation in your life? As a teenager, what happens is eventually they grow up, and do you know what statistics tell us? 85% of nominal Christian teenagers stop going to church after they have a choice. And you know what they do? They're intellectually honest enough to admit this seat is miserable. If your heart is not in it, why would you want to get out of bed on a Sunday and drag yourself to a place like this? And so do you know what a lot of teenagers do? When they turn adults, they're like, yeah, I don't really, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. And guess what? Nobody wants to be a part of that. Nobody likes the people in this seat. The people in this seat have a problem with these people. The people in this seat have a problem with these people. Why don't you just get out of the seat and choose one of the other seats? It's a lot more comfortable over here. The, the cost is a lot less than it is over here. Um, you get a lot more sleep. There's a lot less guilt. If, if you just remove all of the exposure to the Christian culture... But if you're in this seat and the Holy Spirit starts working on you, you know what you find out? 
the cost to be in this seat over here is higher, but man, it's a lot more rewarding. And the cost to be in this seat is not near as great as it is to be in the other two seats. I, uh, I was reading a, a book this week. Um, it's by a friend of mine. He's a pastor in Tallahassee, Florida. And the book is called The Unsaved Christian. This is another word that we have to use air quotes, okay? So there are no unsaved Christians. Um, it's just a title. It's just a name. In, in chapter 12, I, get, I was reading through it and like on Friday. I got to chapter 12. And the title of chapter 12 is very interesting. I think it'll be interesting to you. Um, here it is. It's this. Hail Mary, Notre Dame wins. All right, this is a pastor in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. He goes on to tell uh, the story. His name is Dean and Sarah. He, he tells a story about how when he was growing up, uh, he would, his favorite thing to do was hanging out with his grandpa, Papa Tony. And Papa Tony was a huge Notre Dame fan, and they'd watch football together. And, and finally, one day when Dean was nine years old, they took a two-day trip up to South Bend. And he describes going to the grotto and lighting a candle and saying a prayer before the football game. Have you ever done that? And then going to Touchdown Jesus. How many of you have a picture of you and Touchdown Jesus somewhere? And then, do you know about First Down Moses right next to him there in the statue? And he describes all of this. And, and he said, it was a little confusing to me because I'd never heard Papa Tony talk about Jesus before until we got in front of Touchdown Jesus. And I'd never known him to pray before except during a football game and and he 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 had a he said it was the greatest weekend of my life as a nine-year-old boy he said on the way home though he said I asked I asked the obvious question he said Papa Tona why why are we Notre Dame fans I mean we live in Florida they have football in Florida there's teams in Florida my friends are like more committed to the teams in Florida why do we seems like a long way to go to a football game and Papa Tony looked at him and says we are Notre Dame fans because we are Catholic and he said, he was like, I, what's a Catholic? I don't even know what that means. He's like, I know I'm Italian. So I thought it was like an ethnic thing. And he, he continued to ask questions until and, and he, he found out that, that the, the only attachment to religion was just part of the family tradition. Now listen, whether you would identify as Catholic or Baptist or charismatic or Protestant or non denomination it is possible to stay in this seat without ever being challenged whether or not you have had a genuine conversion from unbelief to belief. I want to ask you, which chair are you in? Maybe today you've come as just part of your tradition. You just showed up, you grabbed your Bible, you grabbed your pen, you grabbed your face covering, and you came to church because that's what we do. And especially if you're a young person, how long are you going to go in that middle seat without realizing it's miserable there. It's not satisfying at all. This is what I'd like to ask you to do. The team's gonna come and we're gonna sing a song of response, but there's nothing that can happen up here on this platform that can get you out of this, that middle seat. I want you to stand with me right now and stay engaged. We're gonna be out of here in just a minute. But it has been my prayer that no one would leave this room as a nominal Christian. Have you been a Christian in name only? Or has there been a genuine transformation in your heart? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? And before we rush out of here and get distracted by a thousand other things, if your life somehow was to tragically end today, do you have absolute confidence that your sin has been forgiven? You have a home in heaven. Jesus is not just something that you give public displays of affection to. But there is a real heart relationship that transforms you, not just one time when you pray a prayer 30 years ago, but a daily, ongoing, continual belief, repentance, trust, confidence. You fall, you falter, you re-believe, you re-repent every time you hear the gospel. If that's never happened for you, why don't you just open up your heart for him right now? First thing you have to do is you have to admit, even though I've gone through the motions, even though I look good really externally, even though I compare pretty favorably to a lot of quote-unquote Christians I know, 
I need a savior. I'll never be good enough. I can't do more. I can't try harder. Jesus, I am trusting that what is necessary has already been done on the cross to pay my penalty and by your life to perform my perfection. I trust you. I stop trusting myself. I'm not trusting my family tradition. I'm not trusting my religious experience. I'm not trusting some baptism ceremony. I'm not trusting confirmation, Christian education. I'm trusting Christ. You can do that in your heart right now. He's listening. Tell him. We're going to sing together. And after we sing, the pastors, elders, their wives will be here at the front to receive you. If you would like to make a profession of faith, to publicly say, I am, I'm so tired of being fake and phony and counterfeit. I'm trusting Christ. And we can talk to you about those next steps. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would strip away the veneer pray that you would expose the heart the way that you did for me. I remember those three years of being miserable in that metal seat until you finally convinced me to humble myself and to receive the only thing that could save my soul, your work on the cross. Do it for many here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.